Okay, everybody, today we're going to start talking about specific communication vehicles you're going to use in the workplace, namely letters, memos, and emails today. Um, as we talk about them, we'll talk about these concepts of formality and convenience and how they trade off with each other. We'll talk about then letters, memos, and emails specifically. You'll note that as far as formatting and sort of special rules for how these should be formatted go, we're not going to talk about those things specifically because the book does a pretty good job of covering. There's not much point in regurgitating. Plus, we're going to set aside some classroom time for you guys to create templates for yourselves for letters and memos that you can use in future assignments. And as far as emails go, I'm going to, I'm going to gripe a little bit. All right, let's start off by talking about formality and convenience. Um, Formality and convenience come in a trade-off in the way you, we communicate. Um, something that tends to be more formal feels less convenient, um, but with that comes the weight and importance of formality. You know, for example, if you get a letter in the mail saying you're receiving a job offer, that letter would feel really special. In fact, you'd probably hold on to it. Whereas an email you get saying that you've been offered a job, I don't know, you may not save it. You may not care as much about it, even though the net effect is the same from both communications, right? You get a job, congratulations. But there's something about the formality taking time. There's something about the formality being less convenient that's important to us. And so it comes at a cost. You have to put in the extra work to make the communication feel more formal, like a fancy invitation to a banquet, for example. Um, but uh, with that comes a message, right? And the formality itself can be part of your message. Convenience, on the other hand, takes away and diminishes formality. It's like getting the job offer via email. You know, it doesn't communicate the same importance right away as getting a letter in the mail does. And so I want you to consider that as you work on, as you choose these different vehicles for communicating with people to consider this formality convenience trade-off and there are times in which convenience is more important and so you defer to that but you do so at the cost of formality or you pick a message that's more formal a vehicle that's more formal but it takes more time and work for you to prepare it and the and the and the convenience doesn't diminish just for the creator it can also diminish for the recipient right i mean if you're sending a de decision via mail like 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 uh, delivered mail, the problem is that now the recipient has to wait for it, and that diminishes their convenience too. All right, well, let's talk about each of the three vehicles for today and talk about letters first. Um, the thing about letters that I really like is that letters convey a message just by the virtue of getting something in the mail. Letters convey permanence of a decision. They convey commitment to the message that's being put in the letter. Um, they convey respect for the recipient that isn't communicated through email, for example. They, they convey trustworthiness, which is the product of all those three things I've talked about. Letters also can convey severity, meaning if you have to send somebody a letter expressing disappointment or threatening a particular action, getting that in the mail in a stamped envelope conveys a lot more severity than say a threat you might send via email. Um, so on the scale of formality versus convenience letters definitely have formality to them. That hasn't always been the case you know because the way we used to communicate with each other was through letters that we would send in the mail and they were obviously handwritten rather than typed but they actually had an informality to them that was really appealing you know, my wife has been collecting um, and scanning in letters from her family history, and she has these great letters between her grandfather and his mom, and it's full of little drawings that he made and jokes and so forth. Well, all that has kind of gone away because we don't send letters to each other anymore. Um, and so really today, letters are just primarily about formality. Handwritten letters are really rare. Um, but you know, there's sort of an analog to formality, which is still there, even though a written letter feels more formal than maybe you'd want to communicate with a loved one. There is still that permanence, that commitment, that respect, and that trustworthiness that comes from sending a letter in the mail. Um, as far as the format of letters go, review Baker on letter format and writing. He gives really good advice. He sort of gives you standard rules and formattings, like where the date line goes, how do you format the address block proper solicit, um, proper openings for your letter and closings and how to do a signature line and so forth. And, and we'll talk, we can talk about those and practice those in class. So let's talk about memos next. 
You know, memos are a funny thing. They're really just an artifact of the days before email. Um, we didn't have email before, and so inner office communication happened primarily via memo. Um, but the thing about memos is they had a permanent. They have a permanence to them that email doesn't have, and this is, I think, why most organizations have held on to memos. They're really common still in government agencies because memos are still used as sort of an internal official record. Um, it's a way where you communicate internally where it's on the record, it's official. This is my report. This is the decision we made about your employment status. This is, you know, the, the new policy that applies to everybody in the department. W when you send a memo, it conveys a permanence and an importance that, uh, that an email may not accomplish. And I think that's why we still hold on to, to memos, even though emails, you know, have replaced them for the majority of, of functions within an office. So where they fit on the scale, they're, they're not quite as formal as letters, obviously, but they're still pretty formal. Um, they are a little more convenient than letters because you don't have to stick them in the mail. But, um, you know, you still have to sort of format a nice-looking memo for it to feel just as important. And so the convenience is lesser than other forms of communication. Again, on memos, refer to Baker on memo format and writing. He gives good advice on, you know, how to how to put what the right headers are to put on a memo and, and formatting and so forth. And we'll talk about that in class and give you time to build a, a memo template that you can use. So last, let's talk about emails. Um, you know, where emails fit on our scale of formality to convenience is they fit obviously way to the right on convenience. They're very convenient methods of communication. The truth is nowadays, there a lot of people in, in your generation and younger feel they're even less convenient because text messaging and other forms of communication are far more convenient than emails. But emails within an office in a professional setting are the most common, easy way to communicate with other people. Um, uh, there is a there is a permanence to them that's important. That's why this doesn't slide all the way over to the right. But uh, there's also an impermanence to the email. It's easy to delete them, which the IRS can tell you, for example, based on the scandals going on there. But you'll notice I have a little asterisk next to the convenience, and it's because the convenience is very one-sided. Email is far more convenient to the sender than it is to the receiver, and I want to illustrate how. So here I have a sender, and he's writing an email to this receiver. The sender's email says, Hi, Joseph, I'm doing research on, on a career in city management. I know that you've been a city manager for at least a decade. What advice do you have for someone like me? Signed, Chad. Um, you know, that's not a very hard email to draft. Um, but I want you to think about what the recipient has to do now as a receiver of this message. Well, they have to reflect on the wide range of advice to consider to give to this candidate and then condense the advice to what's most to the advice that's most important because that's obviously, you know, what would have to go into the email. You can't just have a long stream of consciousness email. Um, so that requires some editing and consideration and condensation of this, of this wisdom. Then you have to actually sit down and write in a way that effectively conveys years of expertise to a novice. I mean, if you have been doing the same job for 10 years, how do you summarize it into really poignant advice for somebody who doesn't know very much about city management or whatever your career is? And then also, you know, the email is a little vague, right? Because it says, what advice do you have for someone like me? If you don't know very much about Chad, you don't know how to tailor the advice. And so you need to figure out what, what, what Chad means by someone like me. Um, I want you to consider the imbalance in this interaction. The sender's experience, you know, writing this email took maybe two minutes, right? Look up the email address, type this out really quickly, maybe trim it down, edit it, and you can have it out of your inbox. You can have it off of your computer screen in, in under two minutes. I think that's a safe assumption. But it's not that way for the receiver. For the receiver, the interaction is far more involved. I would say that this experience, and this is based on what I've had to do as a professor in replying to student emails, you know, it takes at least 20 minutes to reply. And, and that's because I have to go through all those steps if I'm the receiver here. I want you to think of ways that you can make your emails easier on the recipient. We're going to spend time talking, discussing this in class because this is a great discussion topic and that's part of the reason we have our class time together. I want you to think of ways that email is imbalanced, where it's easier for the receiver and harder on the sender. And I want you to think of ways you can change that. For example, a pet peeve, just to sort of spark our conversation. 
is when students email me asking questions that they could find on their own in the syllabus or in the assignment description. What they're essentially doing is they're lazily offloading the work of finding the answer to me. Um, you know, I still have to, like, it, it gives me something to do where the student could have spent the time looking up the answer in the syllabus or in the assignment description before sending the email. But because email is so convenient, it's so alluring, right, it, it, that looking, re researching through the syllabus or through the assignment description takes far more time than the two minutes it takes to send an email. And that's why we're inclined to send these emails that essentially impose work on other people. I'm going to be on my soapbox a little more in class, but I want you to think of answers to this question so we can discuss them together. The summary is that email gives imbalanced power to the sender, so use the power wisely. You know, email in a lot of ways is like a weapon. Uh, it's something that you can use for good or evil. There's nothing inherently evil about this gun. But the way you use it can make a huge difference in other people's lives, right? And notice how easy it is to pull the trigger, but how long-lasting the consequences can be once the trigger is pulled. Unfortunately, some people use email a lot more like a machine gun than they do even just something simple like a revolver. They use it very indiscriminately, and they send out emails all the time, and they forward people annoying messages. And, and you know, this is true for all kinds of convenient forms of communication. So I'm off my soapbox for now. I'll step back on it when we get together in class. Uh, bring your Baker book to class and your computers and come ready to design a memo and or letter template for you to use in assignments that will be coming for the rest of your time in the program. Um, I'm happy to wander around and my TAs can do this too and we can give you feedback on the formats that you're applying to make sure that they work well for the assignments you'll be doing. All right, I look forward to seeing you all in class.